from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Please welcome curators from the Library of Congress Music Division, singing selections from the Bay Psalms book. The Lord to me a shepherd is, what therefore shall not I? He in the folds of tender grass doth not cause me down to lie. To Please welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington. Welcome to the members room. Originally it was a special reading room for the members of the House of Representatives. And this beautiful space is used today by members of Congress and for special library events such as today's celebration. 
Today, we are proud to open the exhibition, First Among Many, the Bay Psalm book and early moments in American printing. Made possible by David M. Rubenstein, co-founder and co-CEO of the Carlisle Group, chairman of the library's James Madison Council, our first ever private sector national support group. Um, so we want to thank you, David, for your civic-minded philanthropy, continuous generation, uh, generosity to the nation's library. Um, we're deeply grateful to David Doubly so, for sharing his copy of the Bay Psalm book, which alongside the library's copy serves as the focal point of this important exhibition. Um, you know, um, one of the greatest historians of America in the 20th century, Henry Steele Cominger, on his last visit to the Library of Congress, was up in my office looking over the mall, and he said half to himself, half in a whisper, these are the last words I ever heard him speak. He said, you know, the United States is the first political entity that was, whose institutional structures and whose conceptions were basically entirely framed in the age of print. And this is the beginning of that printing in the United States, and we're very privileged to be able to host it and to welcome uh, David Rubenstein. Visitors to this exhibition will get a rare insight into the history of early printing in America. From this first book to the broadsides, the pamphlets, the newspapers, and books that over the next 150 years helped shape a revolution in political thinking and a new nation brought forth in this continent. So today, David will discuss the significance of the Bay Psalm book as the first of these, but other moments also in the early American printing and its productions with Mark Dimination, chief of the library's rare book and special collections division, who is the curator of the exhibition. So, please, please join me in thanking for the musical opening, welcoming David Rubenstein and Mark Dimination. Well, Mr. Rubenstein, before we begin with our conversation, I would like to echo the thanks that Dr. Billington has Thank just um, mentioned. Uh, those of us who work in our fields oftentimes don't get to have an opportunity to play with books quite the way I've had in the last few months. And it's been the arrival of um, the chance to exhibit your base on book. It's made it possible, and you have made the exhibition possible as well. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, you, a few, hmm, about a year and a half ago, uh, made some news for yourself um, and have entered the annals of book history uh, with a rather significant um, auction prize paid for a very early piece of American printing. Could you talk a little bit about how you came yes. to the awareness of the Bay Psalm book and your decision to enter into the auction? Well, um, sometimes the stories are not as grand as you might think, but um, I had uh, a few years earlier bought the uh, only copy in private hands of the Magna Carta. And it was auctioned by Sotheby's. And the auctioneer at that time was the man in charge of the manuscript division, and his name was David Redden. And uh, when this came available, um, he um, sent me a letter about it, and I read about it. And I can't say that I was the leading expert in the United States on the Bay Psalms book, but I recognized that it was the first book printed in the United States, and there are only 11 copies of them. Uh, uh, 10 of them are in the United States, and one is in England, I believe. And this was the only one that probably would be in, maybe available for private hands. It was owned by um, South Church in Boston, which had at one point had had five copies in its possession. And um, 
They, over the years, uh, sold some of them off. They had, uh, I think, two left. The church was in need of some repairs. The, the church uh, congregation voted to, to, uh, to, to sell it. Um, and there was some concern about whether they should sell one of their heirlooms, but they decided to do it because they needed the money. And the, so they put it up for sale. I read about the history of it, but unfortunately, as is often the case, I just was traveling, and so I couldn't um, be at the auction. So I was in Melbourne, Australia, and um, I had to make a speech, and I had about 15 minutes before I had to make the speech, and the auction was gonna start 15 minutes before I was supposed to make my speech. So I called into David Redden's office and said, look, I would like to bid from Australia. I don't really know if I have a chance. I'm not really there, and I wish I was there. And uh, so um, I listened to the bidding for a while, and the person said, would you like to put in a bid? And I said, well, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, I'll put in a bid. I'd like to get it if I could, and I put in a bid, and Next thing I know, they said sold. I didn't know if there was anybody else bidding against me. I don't know. Um, so um, let me describe why it's so significant, if I could. Um, the Puritans came over to the United States, roughly, or to the colonies, or what was the Massachusetts Bay Colony, in 1620. And um, they had a tough life. Now, they were, they were rebelling a bit against the English church, although, uh, as we know, Henry VIII broke away and created the Anglican Church uh, and was different than the Catholic Church. The Anglican Church was, had a lot of traditions of the, of the Catholic Church and there were some people in the English uh, Reformation period of time who thought that the Anglican Church was still a little bit too Catholic in many ways. And so there, among those people were the Puritans and they broke away and some of them left to go to the Netherlands, some of them went down to the Caribbean and some of them went to what became the United States. Um, they came here in 1620. Um, and they had a tough life. Uh, one of the things that they did when they came here is they prayed because they were not against religion. They believed in just praying a different way. In the Catholic Church, and to some extent the Anglican Church, uh, what they did was uh, prayers were sung, but they were sung by a choir or maybe one or two people. And the Puritans believed that it was appropriate for everybody to participate in the singing, not just the choir and not just maybe a few religious officials. And so they had um, a use, as, and, and, and the, and the uh, Anglican Church believed some of that as well, but the uh, way that it was done in the Anglican Church was not pleasing to the Puritans, among other reasons, so they left. When they came to, the United, to what became the United States, but the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they were using prayer books called Psalters, P-S-A-L-T-E-R-S, -E Psalters, um, which were prayer books. And basically, they were using the prayer books that they had had from the Anglican Church. However, the Puritans, being pure, felt that these translations of the Bible were not really appropriate, that they, they were used a lot of colloquialisms and, and a lot of uh, things that were not really the word of, of, uh, of David from the, uh, from the Psalms in the, in the Hebrew Bible. So they got about 30 or so ministers uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony to come together and say, we wanna have our own prayer book, one that is more accurately describing uh, what the prayers are and the Psalms are in the, in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament. So they had people who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into uh, an accurate view in English of what these Psalms were, and they had to print it up. Now, how did they get a printing press? Well, there were no printing presses in the colonies. So what happened was, um, they began to put word forth that they wanted to get a printing press. And in 1638, uh, a, a, uh, uh, a religious official who wasn't happy with the Anglican Church, he resigned his commission from the Anglican Church. I mean, one of the reasons he resigned his commission was in the Anglican Church in those days, you had to say at the end of each service on Sunday morning that it was okay to exercise and use physical exercise on Sundays um, after the church service is over. And some people, Puritans, thought, well, this isn't very good. We shouldn't be exercising and doing physical activity on Sundays. And if you were a, a, a minister in the Anglican Church, you had to uh, say that it was appropriate to do that. So this minister uh, uh, didn't like that, and he resigned. And he basically um, uh, decided to move over to the colonies, and he took his wife and his children, and they brought uh, in a, a, an official with him, not official, a, a worker with him, and so forth. And they brought over with them a printing press. Um, however, on the way over, the minister died. 
And so when he got over here, or when, when, when they got over here, um, they had the printing press, a rudimentary printing press, but uh, the printing press was then owned by his wife, Elizabeth. Um, then um, she didn't know how to operate it, and so a man who had been with them named Stephen Day took over the operation of the printing press, and he began to figure out how to use it. It was a very rudimentary printing press, and in the end, he, pr he printed, the first thing they printed was an oath, an oath to the colonies, and that everybody was supposed to e exercise that if they wanted to vote. Uh, all copies of that have now been lost. The second thing they printed was an almanac. All copies of that have now been lost. The third thing they printed was the Bay Psalms book. Remember, the ministers had come together. They had said, here's how the, the accurate Hebrew translation would be, and they had these psalms, and they printed that. They printed roughly 1,700 copies in the first edition. And at the time, there were roughly uh, about 15 to 20,000 people in the Bay Colony, and uh, they um, um, distributed them to the various churches. There were a fair number of churches, and uh, people basically used these to to pray. Now, they said in the, in the, in the book, this is uh, not to pray, to, but to, to sing the Psalms. They said in the, in the book, there's a lot of typos in here, and that's in part because the printing press was very rudimentary, and the, the, the Mr. Day may not have been a very good speller, and sometimes on one page he'll spell the same word three different ways. Um, he also, they didn't have any uh, apostrophes that they came over with the typeset, so they used commas where the apostrophes were beat. So they, it was very rudimentary. They didn't have any music notes because they didn't have music notes as part of the typeface, so they couldn't really put the music notes in how you were supposed to sing these things. But anyway, it became a very popular book. It went through many editions and ultimately went through different editions and so forth. And um, of the 1700, again, there are only 11 left. So what is its significance? Its significance is this was the first book actually printed in the United States. And it kind of, um, uh, its copies kind of just bring you back to what our country was in those days. It was a very religious place. Uh, people were, or their first book is probably not uh, surprisingly a religious related book. So that's the significance of it was it was the first and that's basically the history of it and that's probably more than everybody wants to know about the Bay Psalms book. <laughs> um, I was very pleased to hear uh, two of the Psalms performed today. I don't know if you've heard them bef the music before or not because I think it actually brings a slightly different notion to what one imagines to be the great severity of the church at the yes. time. Now, um, the psalms as they were sung today, while beautiful, were died out after about a hundred years. It was often thought that um, the melodies and the way they were sung were not as maybe as um, melodious as maybe they should be. And so after about a hundred years, they began to change the way these psalms were both uh, written, they, they translated them differently, and also they, they sang them differently. But for about a hundred years, uh, what you heard today is what they, what they had in the Bay Colony. And the reason it's called the Bay Psalms book, it was the Psalms book of the Bay Colony. And um, I, I think interestingly, when I bought it, there was an article in the New York Times from the uh, woman in charge of the process at the, the South Church. And uh, you know, you never know whether you, when you pay the highest price that's ever been paid for a book, whether you've overpaid and you feel, you know, maybe I've, I paid too much. Well, she said, you know, we didn't really think we'd get very much for this. We're really thrilled with this price. So I realized I had probably <laughs> overpaid, but anyway. <laughs> you never look back after an auction of that nature. Well, up until then, I think the last time one had been sold, I think it sold for a long time ago for maybe $150,000. This one I think was, was more, but uh, I'd say, um, the, the most expensive book up until then was not the Bay Psalms book, but the Gutenberg Bible was probably the most expensive. But no Gutenberg Bible has come on sale for maybe two decades or so. I suspect if one Gutenberg Bible of the 53 that are around came on, I guess they would probably go for $50 million or something like that. You would know better than I. It would, it would probably fetch a, a grand price, but you're, you're forever locked in now at the moment wow. um, with uh, your current purchase. What I most appreciate about the opportunity for us to have both copies on display, they look very different from each other, which tells a bit of the story of how these last 11 survived along the way. But people who come to the exhibition might have an opportunity to realize that these are copies that lived together at one point in a collection, so they've been rejoined. Uh, for the first time after many a, a, a century. Well, the Library of Congress's copy came from the, the, the same church, right? It was bought by somebody and ultimately came here. Right. So they, they at one point had been sitting on the shelf together until they went off into um, the land of, of uh, collections. So interestingly, um, or I hope you'll think it's interesting, what happened was the widow, Elizabeth, 
um, she ultimately married a man named Henry Dunster. Any of you who went to Harvard would know there's a Dunster house, and Mr. Dunster was the first president of Harvard. And ultimately, um, when she died, he took the printing press and said, it's mine, and he sold it to Harvard. And he was then sued by the children of, of the original minister and Elizabeth because they said, well, wait a second, you were the second husband and our father owned this printing press and why do you have the right to sell it to Harvard? And, and that's how we know there were 1,700 copies printed because in the litigation it goes through uh, how much the losses were and so forth and so on. But interestingly, it was Harvard that actually owned uh, the printing press for a while and they paid a very modest amount. And to buy the original Bay Psalms book, it cost 20 pence, which was not that much. Mm -hmm. So it gives us, uh, what I like the most about seeing these books together, uh, there's a reality to seeing physical materials on display. Um, given the number of books that were published, that only 11 survived, gives us a sense of how um, heavily used they must have been over time, that they either were replaced as new editions came out or were literally worn out. Well, and that's because they were supposed to be, you know, they were prayer books, that were psalm books, and people were supposed to hold them. They weren't like the Gutenberg Bible was not really printed for average people to kind of thumb through it and sing from it or read from it or something. Mm -hmm. this, that's, this was really a, a song book, really, in effect. That's why it, they're probably not in great condition relative to the Gutenberg Bible, let's say, among other reasons. Uh, five of the uh, uh, copies of the Bay Psalm book are lacking a title page. That's the condition of uh, the Library of Congress copy. Uh, yours is replete with the title page. Ours is also, uh, un interestingly now, in, in historical terms, was owned by a very generous man named George Livermore, who upon purchasing uh, the slightly flawed copy was asked by a dealer if he would sell 12 more pages to help somebody else complete their copy. So our copy is incomplete with 12 pages lurking in the, in the New York Public Library. Um, a, a situation we're thinking about maybe remedying um, historically. Um, but your copy has come to us by a very different means. Well, um, what I had wanted to do was this. Uh, when I buy something, I don't like to put it in my house. In fact, I have nothing in my house. I, I like to put it on display. So the, like the Magna Carta is on display at the, at the National Archives. Um, rare copies of the Declaration of Independence I put at the State Department or the National Archives or um, the Smithsonian or Mount Vernon. And um, in this case, when I did buy it, I said I would like to put it on display at libraries so people could come see it. And so my hope is that people will come see it. But what's the point of seeing it? Uh, what, what's, what are you really trying to do? What I'm trying to do is to get people to appreciate um, the significance of books, how important they were to our history, how important they are to humanity, and also to think more about our history. Because you know, seeing the Bay Psalms book isn't gonna all of a sudden make you um, a, a person that is brilliant about early American history, but you might be inspired to go back and read more about it. And so that's why I think a lot of these historic documents are important. It, it really gives somebody who goes to see them a chance and say, okay, I need to learn more about it. Let me go back and read more about it. And I hope people will go back and learn more, not only about the Bay Psalms book, but about other American uh, early printing. And, and you're an expert in that. So let me ask you, suppose the Bay Psalms book did not exist, uh, what would be the, um, you know, most valuable early American book, and what uh, do you think is the most impressive thing in the Library of Congress's early American collection? If the Bay Psalm book did not exist. Uh, the Bay Psalm book really is that pebble in the pond that sparks a certain kind of printing in America, which is quite different from what we get in Europe. Um, certainly following it immediately is the Eliot Indian Bible, although I can't imagine for a moment that an 1,100-page Bible printed 20 years after the Bay Psalm would have come into effect had it not been for the, the emergence of the press in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, the first Bible printed in America is in Algonquin, the Algonquin language, uh, and uh, ultimately emerges as one of the great pieces of uh, 17th century printing, uh, in part printed by the individual who was also involved with uh, uh, Stephen Day's press. Mm -hmm. Um, from there, I think, you know, the interesting part about American printing, partly because it's a colonial uh, economy and they can't do certain things. Uh, economically, it's less beneficial to print books, say, for uh, example, in the colonies. You can actually get them cheaper from England. Printing in America takes on a kind of rough and rugged economy of broadsides, pamphlets, and interestingly enough, these 
objects which are more bread and butter printing are ultimately the pieces of printing that will pave the way to a very effective communication during the revolution. So I think rather than something iconic like a Psalter, I would hazard a guess that uh, without the base psalm book, it more likely would have been something like a broadside or a pamphlet. Right. So the broad, well, a broadside, uh, well, the broadside of the Declaration of Independence is, uh, you know, wasn't a book, but maybe the most important thing printed. Uh, and I, you know, for those who may be familiar with the broadsides, when the Declaration of Independence was printed on July the 5th, they went to uh, John Dunlop and asked him to print up, I believe it was 200 copies of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, the library has one of these uh, uh, Dunlop copies. I think two, two, you have two. Albert Small has one that he's given to University of Virginia. Um, and I, you know, there aren't that many of them in, in private hands now. Um, Norman Lear owned one of them. And, and this was, the historic thing is, the, the reason it's so important is, this was the first time all Americans actually saw what the Declaration of Independence about why we were breaking away from England. And a copy was sent right after it was printed on July the 5th to uh, George Washington to read to the troops. Uh, copies were sent to each of the colonies to explain why we were gonna break away from England. A copy was sent to King George. Um, and uh, you know there, there aren't that many of these copies left. I, I'd say of the 200 maybe, less than maybe, less than a dozen maybe exists, something like that. Well, when Norman Lear had uh, bought a copy for about $8 million, and uh, he uh, used it a number of years ago to have demonstrations around the country to school children about this document because it's on one page that had the entire um, Declaration of Independence. And then he sold it uh, through Sotheby's uh, in a private sale, and uh, one time Norman Lear called me and said, well, I, I don't know, did you buy it? I, I, thought you might have been the person to buy it. I said, no, it wasn't offered to me. I don't know who bought it. Anyway, I was in somebody's house not too long after he called me, and I saw what looked like a perfect copy of the Declaration of Independence, a Dunlop copy. And I, um, you know, went to the person and said, uh, you know, did you buy this from Norman Lear? Because I, I heard it was been sold for $25 million. And he says, no, no, no. If I'd spent $25 million, I would know that's, that's not that copy. So anyway, I got an email from this person two days later and said, yes, I forgot, I did buy it. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was Bill Gates. Yeah. And, uh, so it's in his house and it's a wonderful copy. I hope but, someday we all get to live in that kind of world. <laughs> um, but he, he's actually a very, very good collector. He's got an incredible library. Not as good as the Library of Congress, but he has a very good, uh, very good library. I would say it's interesting as well, when you think about it, in the, in the early Bay Psalm, in the early Bay Colony, there were no people who were Jewish. Um, they were, everybody was Puritan. And, um, but the Puritans probably, probably didn't like people who were Jewish. I don't really know. There wasn't any anti-Semitism. There were no people to be anti-Semitic against. But um, they loved Hebrew. They loved the Hebrew language. And early in colonies, they loved Greek, and they loved Latin, and they loved uh, Hebrew. And they thought that you could only really have an accurate Bay Psalms book if you went back to the original Hebrew and actually did the interpretation. So they got the ministers to go back, and every one of these ministers could actually read Hebrew because that was one of the languages that they, they thought was very important. So while they might not have loved people who were Jewish, they loved the language that the Jewish people had developed, I guess. I think this is all built into the document when you look at it, because this is in the midst of a colony by the time they started. It had only been settled for 10 years. They're still building buildings and still dealing with the land, and yet they managed to call together 30 ministers to retranslate the Psalms from Hebrew into a metered rhyme. I, it, there's a vibrancy to this document that I think really is a story to be told. Um, the Declaration of Independence that we do have on display, the Dunlap copy, is also paired with uh, uh, Catherine Goddard's printing, the second official printing, with the names attached, and the first newspaper printing, which brings to um, a story, uh, the evolution of American printing. These documents, these broadsides and newspapers moved very quickly through the colonies. Uh, almost ironically, the very thing that the English were trying to prevent they actually allowed to have happen by uh, allowing printing presses to go to this route of ephemeral printing. So that in addition to the uh, um, right. copies you were talking about, people are getting on horseback and riding out with a declaration Dunlap copy, reading it aloud on the steps of the court, uh, courthouse, having it copied and going on to the next town. This is how uh, oh. the colonies were informed. In the original broadside, the names of those people who signed the declaration, the declaration was not signed on July the 4th. It was signed on um, August the 2nd. And the reason was when they finished the debate on July the 4th of what would, should be in the declaration, and they 
um, in Thomas Jefferson's view, mutilated what he had written, and they took out a lot of his things. They then went next door to the, to the uh, uh, printer and said, take this copy of what we've agreed to and print it up. That copy that they, the printer used, Mr. Dunlop, does not exist. The Library of Congress has Thomas Jefferson's early drafts. You have those. Uh, but actually, we don't know what, uh, what cop where the copy is that they actually printed it from. Thomas Jefferson, when he was not happy with what the Congress had done, took his drafts and took what Congress did and sent them out to his friends and said, don't you think my version is better <laughs> than, uh, than what they did? But they didn't, they didn't put the names on the original broadside. So all John Hancock and all the people who signed it, 56 people that signed it, were not put on. Some people say, since it was treason, they didn't want to really have their name on it. Uh, they actually came back on August the 2nd and uh, did sign it. So they, on July the 4th, we didn't really know who was going to sign it or not. They came back on August the 2nd, signed it. The reason they did is because they, they had to take a couple days to get it engrossed, but also New York State hadn't yet approved uh, withdrawing from England, so they had to get that done, and that was done. They came back on August the 2nd. And then it, they didn't print, as you said, the names until January. Some people say that they didn't want their names printed until they had more success in the war to make it more likely that they were going to win, correct. and they won a battle in Trenton, and all of a sudden they put their names out. That may not be fair. So some of you, by, they're just a historical uh, incident. Why do you think we celebrate the 4th of July, not the 2nd of July? Well, here's the reason. On the 2nd of July, that is when Congress voted to, to break away from England. And John Adams wrote to his wife, uh, Abigail, and said, this will be the most important day in American history. We'll celebrate it with fireworks forever because this is the day we voted to break away. But the declaration was approved on the 4th of July. Um, well, what happened was they wanted to celebrate the 2nd of July because the declaration wasn't seen as important as what happened on July the 2nd. But the next year, July the 2nd, 1777, they were in the Continental Congress meeting and they forgot. They forgot, <laughs> they realized at the end of the day, we forgot to celebrate. <laughs> so let's get organized. And they got around to celebrating the 4th of July. So for that period of time, they began celebrating the 4th of July. Well, John Adams wasn't happy because he was the instigator of the, declara of the movement to, to be independent. And Thomas Jefferson was like the 4th. In fact, the 4th of July was celebrated because that was his document. So for 50 years, yes. for 50 years, they kind of sparred over that. And interestingly, as we all know, they died on exactly the same day 50 years later, 1826. And uh, at the On end, July 4th. July the 4th. <laughs> and people thought that was a sign from God that these people had really done something significant. Yeah. There is a, probably an apocryphal story of John Hancock looking at the broadside coming off the press of John Dunlap and saying, is mine the only treason? His is the only name right. that appears on the original printed document, the one that does in fact get sent to George III, um, and hence the urge immediately to have them come back to sign. Um, so uh, the pairing of these three uh, declarations, which is difficult to do, as you well know, in terms of collecting, uh, I think is a really powerful uh, part of the story of American printing. Prior to that is a copy of the first printing of Common Sense, which to me, I think, is, is probably the singular example of what um, the modest, um, uh, rough and tumble printing of America could accomplish in one year in 1776 when half a million copies of common sense were distributed to a population of 2.5 million. That's yes. one per every five people in the colonies. And it, it, it's a, uh, it moves beyond information to really understanding the wave of revolution right. that comes from well, The amazing thing about the common sense and its influence was probably the most, it was probably the most influential book printed in, in the early days of our country is that the man who wrote it was an Englishman. And it wasn't like an American who said, let's break away. It was an Englishman who, who basically came over here and uh, openly wrote that book, of which there, I don't know how many copies there are of the original uh, uh, of Common Sense. I don't assume there are that many left with the original cover. Yeah, not many. And in fact, the real collecting emphasis for Common Sense is to collect all the editions, right. which is equally uh, difficult. What is interesting, and I, do, I think does speak of early printing in some areas, uh, there are printers in the colonies who are not afraid of identifying as either patriot um, or um, uh, royal, well, mostly patriot. Um, and certainly copies of Common Sense were published uh, anonymously, but with the printer's name still at the bottom, taking, taking a position that in many cases uh, forced them to move quickly. 
um, as the English were marching forward because they were identified as patriot right. printers. And many, remember, final comment about this is, well, you might not say a person who just prints up something is that important relative he's doing a ministerial thing, printing something that somebody else wrote, but printers had a lot of influence. They were very wealthy people, relatively speaking, and the most famous of them was Benjamin Franklin. And he was a printer. He made so much money in printing, he retired at the age of 42 and basically did all, all many of the great things he did after uh, he retired as a printer. But printers were pretty well respected people by, mm -hmm. by and large in the colonies. Mm -hmm. so. I think we're, uh, if, you, if you're willing, we're gonna close. Now, if I'd ask the audience to please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Rubenstein once again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. As you could tell, uh, David Rubenstein is a lifelong champion of literacy and reading. He's the lead benefactor of the Library of Congress's National Book Festival, which will celebrate in September its 15th anniversary on the September 5th. He established the library's Literacy Awards, which honor organizations making outstanding contributions to increasing literacy in the United States and abroad. Um, David's position um, uh, and his passion for reading began when he received the library card at 8-6 uh, and began to devour all the books at the Enoch Pratt Library in Baltimore. So David, as a small token of our appreciation for your strong support of this institution, for enlivening as well as making possible um, this exhibit, we wanted to present you with a little reproduction of two items related to the Pratt Library from the Library of Congress's own collections. A photograph showing the interior space and a floor plan, both from the 1933 place that you seem to have begun this passion uh, for literacy and reading. And uh, so I'd like to invite you to come up and Take this little souvenir of our gratitude and perhaps of okay. some memory for you, and after which uh, we'll take a photograph of this, and after which uh, everyone should join uh, here at the Library of Congress for refreshments and to view the exhibition with our curators. So David, once again, thank, thank you, you thank much. you, Mark, and thank, thank you, you this evening. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.